Welcome to this special episode on evolving India Sri Lanka relations brought to you by Center for Public Policy Research CPPR a think tank dedicated to in-depth evidence based research on various public policy matters I am Neelima associate research at CPPR today we have a distinguished guest ambassador admiral Janath Kolambage from Sri Lanka joining us for an insightful conversation to analyze india sri lanka relations in the light of sri lankan president his excellency ranil vikram singhe's first official visit to india on july 20 and 21 this year ambassador admiral jayanath kolambage rsp bsv usp fni as a sri lankan flag officer and diplomat he is a serving sri lankan ambassador to indonesia he was a secretary of the ministry of foreign affairs of sri lanka until 2022 prior to which He served as the additional secretary to the president for foreign relations. A career naval officer, he had served as the commander of the Sri Lankan Navy, the professional head of the Navy from September 2012 to June 2014. Welcome, sir, to the CPPR dialogue. It is an Thank you very much. Good evening, and ab- nice to be with you again. It's an absolute pleasure to have you back here again to discuss the key aspects of India-Sri Lanka relations. So Sri Lankan president his excellency Ranil Vikram Singhe's visit to India comes at a time when India and Sri Lanka marks 75 years of diplomatic relations so he held his official interaction with prime minister Narendra Modi on 21 July 2023 exactly one year after he joined the office on July 21 2022 so this was the first official visit to India since taking up the job last year after an economic meltdown forced his predecessor to flee India is Sri Lanka's closest neighbor. The relationship between the two countries is more than 2500 years old and both sides have built upon a legacy of intellectual, cultural, religious and linguistic interactions. Both the leaders unveiled agreements on technology, renewable energy, greater connectivity designed to deepen bilateral relations between India and Sri Lanka. A vision document titled Promoting Connectivity, Catalyzing Prosperity was also adopted Uh, to strengthen maritime air energy and people to people connectivity to boost the economic partnership between both the countries also further exchange they have exchanged mous on cooperation in the field of animal husbandry development project in trikan malay district in eastern sri lanka and online payment services between india and sri lanka so in the light of president ranil vikramasinghe's uh, first official visit to india a lot of initiatives were taken in multiple sectors as we have mentioned above so could you elaborate on whether the visit had a notable impact and what are the primary key takeaways that merit the scrutiny well anilam uh, neelima thank you so much for the question uh, well you see i i watched this uh, uh, the episodes of our president visiting india very closely and i was reading the statements coming out from both the capitals and i'm very happy and i'm very optimistic uh, i think one when one look at india india sri lanka relations we always say we have a long historical relations uh, more than 2000 years and in the near near recent history uh, our trade goes back to about 700 years how close we are people to people culturally uh, via religion dance forms food habits clothing everything we keep talking about it but unfortunately uh, the connection or the linkage between india and sri lanka uh, has not been continuously on a steady path uh, you know you sometimes depending on the leadership depending on the political climate uh, in in especially in sri lanka Uh, there are we see ups and downs of our relations between india and sri lanka however this visit i think is quite a different visit and that is why i feel this is a very significant visit then why i say this is significant visit is it has i think not just limited to talk i mean it is not just a state visit of uh, one leader uh, visiting another country yes that was a state visit but i think it goes much much beyond that and i think it basically encompasses the main areas that we have been talking on and off from time again now that is the beauty of this visit i think this is a they have kind of built upon the foundations laid by the previous successive governments uh, successive people 
successive leaders. But this time it's different. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, the areas that uh, the two leaders discussed were very broad and widespread and beneficial to both the countries. You know, India is a big country. There is no two words about it. Giant in economic power, military power, population, everything is big. Sri Lanka is a very small country. But I guess uh, by living close to a big neighbor, uh, Sri Lanka basically had reservations about India's intentions from time to time. And uh, it is, I think, common to practically all the small uh, states surrounded by a big neighbor. But this visit is different even in that sense because there are a lot of confidence building measures positive concrete action proposed by the two leaders. Uh, I'm not only talking about the memorandum of understanding. I think we have to look at the spirit of this uh, understanding of MOUs because they covered a wide area. It is air, maritime, energy, power, trade, economic, financial, and people-to-people -people connectivity. Now, we have been, as I mentioned, Talking about these things, bits and pieces, you know, not as the in, in a total uh, scenario. But right now, I think the complete change of mood I witness, especially from Sri Lanka and even from India. I think India treats, uh, I think, uh, I think the Prime Minister Modi is uh, one of the first policies that he launches, neighborhood first policy. And of course, you know, we, we can't uh, deny the fact that. If India did not help Sri Lanka in 2022, when we had a very dire economic crisis, we were almost going, we were almost in the top three worst countries in the world. But fortunately, Sri Lanka did not go that way like expected or predicted by many analysts that we would be a failed state. One thing is, it is not even in the interest of India to have a failed state in its southern neighborhood. That is another very important point that we must remember. So in that light, I think this visit is very significant and they have laid a very solid foundation. Now, I only hope that this will not be derailed in any way, but the, bo but the both countries, both the governments, both the people will capitalize on this achievement, capitalize on this progress made by the two leaders and make sure that action, I mean, actionable things will happen in a time-based framework. Otherwise, what will happen is we keep talking until the sun rises from the other side. And at the end of the day, basically we come back to the same topic again and again. But I feel the things have changed. Of course, Sri Lanka, I must say, uh, appreciate the valuable assistance given by India in its worst economic crisis, not just another economic crisis, but in the worst possible economic crisis where we did not have fuel, gas, medicine, food, and there were long queues in the country. So India, keeping to the true spirit of neighborhood first policy and treating Sri Lanka as another independent sovereign country and without allowing Sri Lanka to be a failed state, they came forward. I mean, yes, we talk about 5 billion US dollars. That is a great amount. But I see the signals. You know, when India provide that 5 billion US dollars, it gave confidence to Sri Lanka. It gave confidence to other bilateral lenders. It gave confidence to the businesses. And it gave confidence to the prospective investors. So that way, I don't think Sri Lanka can ever forget. We will not, I think. I mean, that is uh, amply demonstrated by President time and again, how grateful Sri Lanka is for India for coming to help in the most difficult period of its history. I mean, this is just one incident where India has come. I remember when I was in the Navy 2004 tsunami. You know, when you have suffered immense losses in your coastal areas, you send ships with necessary equipment to rescue people in Sri Lanka within the day itself. Now, that who will do that? I, I remember very vividly because this is 26 December 2020, uh, 2004, and I was the acting area commander in the Eastern Naval Area, and the Indian ships arrived on the next day early morning with most essential items for a recovery 
for a recovery of such a magnitude calamity, natural disaster, we have never experienced in the history. I just gave one example. I mean, people should not think only the bailout uh, that provided by India uh, as a support. But then I just wanted to mention that India has always been there. However, I mean, between the two capitals, there were some misunderstanding, there were some miscommunication, there was some uh, kind of uh, a fear, you know, uh, what, why is India doing this kind of a feeling? But I think even now, when you look at the people's perception, I think that is also important for a bilateral relationship between the between two countries, people have to be there to support the government to carry out their policies. Otherwise, the president or the parliament or the cabinet cannot act alone because there will be a backlash. And, and you know they will be wiped out if they don't listen to the people. Now here, very importantly, the people's perception about India and the importance of India is again at a very good level, I would say. I'm very happy to see that, right? And then, you know, India, we need to understand India is an economic power. And soon the prediction is India will be the third largest economy on GDP terms. Now, why should not Sri Lanka benefit from that neighbor? I mean, I always use this word, Sri Lanka's economy should piggyback on Indian economy when India is doing so well, so greatly. Well, we have to understand India did not, I mean, it was a so slow progress, uh, slow process, all right. But if you look at the last decade of India's growth, it is phenomenal. It is unparalleled, right? Now, we always said that, you know, South Asia, we don't have a, a black swan who is always only with the others. But now we have a black swan who has broke away from the flock and moving brilliantly ahead. So this is the right time we must benefit from India's economic growth. Now, the leadership in India is very much following the neighborhood first policy, and they have offered the best possible assistance to Sri Lanka. And also I must mention that the giving 5 billion US dollars and India did not stop at that. India took the leadership role in external debt restructuring. Now that again gave a very beautiful message to the Paris Club and the other bilateral lenders. Now India is fully on board, they have supported and they are not demanding the return of money immediately and they did not even stop at that. They wanted to get other people on board for external debt restructuring. What more can we ask from India? This is my point. What more can we ask from India? So right now, everything is great. You know, all this time, as I mentioned, we were only talking about the historical ties. Leave that apart. We know that. I don't think our leaders are fully aware of, our people are fully aware of historical facts. That is okay. It is there. It is written, recorded everywhere. But now, I think we have unleashed, we have opened a beautiful new chapter in relations between our two countries, and we must not miss this opportunity. Now, we talk about economic integration, this time in detail, we talk about energy, uh, becoming an energy hub. I mean, Sri Lanka or Trincomalee becoming the energy hub with Indian support. We talk about ferry connectivity. The last ferry operated, of course, there was a ferry uh, in between, there was a ferry between uh, Sri Lanka, Port of Colombo, and I think Karikka. But the last normal ferry stopped somewhere around 1983-84. And, you know, we have waited this long, right? I, I think I should blame both sides, not only one side, but we have waited so long about this connectivity process to really give meaningful push to those connectivities. Now, I mean, I have been always, I have served in the northern part of Sri Lanka. I know how close Karikal is. And I have been wondering why can't we import cement from Karikal in, in 12 hours you have the items. And same with Bombay onion and potato and other things. In 12 hours, they are in your doorstep. Right? So we have been not doing the right thing in many spheres, and that is why we went down the drain almost, and thanks to India, we recovered. Of course, other countries helped as well, but India's help is very significant. So this connectivity initiative, now 
people were very skeptical when india uh, had uh, uh, established a flight connectivity between south india and the northern uh, uh, airport of jaffna now that is a thriving sector they are going to even increase the frequency of flight between these two countries right because these two people have lot in common you know 60 million tamils in uh, the tamil nadu and and another large population of tamils in the northern part of sri lanka they have not only cultural religious but they have relatives across the fox strait right so now you see this will give rise to large number of small and medium enterprises you know somebody coming to uh, south india carry 100 kilograms of items sarees or sarong or whatever is good in india and selling and making a living so i think i mean i gave you a very long answer but i really wanted to emphasize the importance of this visit this is not just another state visit it is a very significant one now it is up to the others the ministries the people the the government servant the public servants uh, public servants to carry forward the vision of two great leaders across the fox strait so this is my answer to your first question thank you so much sir that was like a really enlightening and a very elaborate uh, answer to my question on india sri lanka's relations you have come from history to the current new chapter with which both the countries will be opening like and it is you have clearly highlighted it is up to the like it is how, how it depends on how it is taken forward and like the timely action to make this uh, statements and whatever visions they have come up with into the actions uh, which we we hope will be done soon actually but uh, on yeah but on the other side uh, we know that india and sri lanka have a well established history of maritime cooperation because of their geographical geographical proximity and the sharing shared interest they have in the indian ocean region and over the time they have also actively collaborated on initiatives like enhancing security fostering trade and promoting connectivity in the maritime domain so uh, but however the uh, dispute which we have over the fishing rights in the park strait which serves as a separation between the two nations still remains unresolved so even though the vision statement and wield an all encompassing plan for the future there was no clearly mention of the resolution of long standing issues like related to the arrest of indian fishermen so none of the documents actually mentioned uh, this crucial matter so looking ahead how do you perceive the potential what do you see as the potential potential solutions to address this complex issue in the near future well you are very right because if you look at the most common denominator between sri lanka and india is the ocean you know we sri lanka is an island nation india has more than 1400 kilometers of coastline uh, sorry 7500 kilometers of coastline sri lanka has only 1400 kilometers but when i took over the job as foreign secretary way back in 2021 my first statement was that I said India should be our priority number one in strategic security. And I qualified my statement by saying Sri Lanka should never ever be a strategic threat to India. Sri Lanka should not allow its soil to be a, a, a strategic threat to India by any other force and we need to give priority to india's strategic security concern that i said number one i think i got a lot of publicity in india for uh, saying that uh, yes i was condemned i mean criticized by certain uh, parties at that time because the situation was not exactly what we have in 2023 uh, so this is the most important thing you know sri lanka can never afford, I mean, this is a point that my president has emphasized again and again. He said, Sri Lanka, he will not allow Sri Lanka to be used or exploited by anyone to be a strategic security threat to India. We don't have to be. There is no requirement for it. We don't gain anything by doing it. All we gain is if we can ensure that India has concern, India has strategic security concerns around its neighborhood. I mean, not all the neighbors of India are very friendly, not very bon homie. You have issues, right? If Sri Lanka add to that, it is not a good thing. And we should not do it. We must never, ever be a strategic security concern to India. And also, I always believe 
looking at the geographical closeness, geographical proximity of these two countries, we have to understand Sri Lanka, especially the northern part of Sri Lanka is part of the Indian maritime security umbrella. Indian maritime security umbrella because a boat, a high-speed boat from the northern coast of Sri Lanka need only 40 minutes to reach the southern coast of Tamil Nadu, right? So that means Sri Lanka is part and partial of Indian maritime spectrum. Now, that is a fact. That is a geographical fact that we must understand and we must live with. If we try to do something against that, then India will be concerned. India will be concerned. India will not be very happy, right? So this is point number one I like to make. We must never, ever be a strategic security. Now, this point, I think the President uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe has stated very, very clearly in no uncertain terms. Now, this message by my President is not only aimed at India. It is aimed at the wider major players in the, in the Indian Ocean per se. I mean, not only uh, pacifying India, it is giving us clear signal to anyone, please do not think, even think of using Sri Lanka as a, a gateway, as a stepping so, a stone, as a launching pad or a launching platform to do anything against India's strategic security concerns. So this is the point that I really wanted to highlight. That is sacrosanct. We have no way of going against it. We have to maintain that uh, position uh, very clearly emphasized by the president. Then I, uh, you ask, uh, you, you mentioned that there are certain other areas of concern. Of course, India and Sri Lanka has been working in the maritime domain across the Indian Ocean for a very long time. Right, nearly 80 to 90 percent of Sri Lanka naval officers, including me were trained by India, right? I have spent good three years in Indian tra naval training establishment and Indian staff college. So that is my foundation. I mean, what I am today is one, one major reason is the training that I received from India. Now they are continuing and also sharing of intelligence. You know, during the worst time Sri Lanka experienced the, you know, the terrorism at sea. There again, India came forward by providing platforms, you know, the first offshore patrol vessel was gifted by India to Sri Lanka. And the second one followed. And then they built two more advanced offshore patrol vessel, right? Now that helped because India, from Indian point of view, it is critically important, not only in Sri Lanka, basically the Indian Ocean maritime domain remained friendly to India. Basically, the Indian Ocean maritime domain does not become hostile to India. So it is in, in, in the uh, interest of India as well to have a very stable, peaceful uh, uh, maritime region around Sri Lanka. And also, I must mention to you that on the same line, 2011, uh, Indian, um, sorry, the National Security Advisors of India, Sri Lanka and Maldives got together and 2013 born was born the concept of maritime domain awareness. Now we have come a very long way. Of course, I have to say after 2014, nothing much happened in that endeavor as well. But it started picking up again after 2012, uh, sorry, 2020, right? Or rather 2020, yes, it started picking up and we started doing things among the three countries. And also we invited Seychelles and Mauritius to be part of it. And we are now inviting, I believe, I don't know the exact situation right now, Bangladesh to be part of it. So this is one area. And then narcotic, uh, combating uh, illicit drugs uh, across the Pox trade. Again, Indian intelligence, uh, they are sharing intelligence with Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka sharing with together, we can uh, do more arrays. Now, the point that I really want to make is ocean is too big. Even for India to manage everything on its own in the whole of Indian Ocean is not practical. You need partners and Sri Lanka can be one of the best partners because we are maritime neighbors. Unlike the other countries uh, around India, which are land board, uh, they have land borders and maritime component. But Sri Lanka is across the maritime domain. So we are, a, we need to be a reliable, dependable, workable, operational, 
partner across the maritime domain to protect India's maritime security strategy. And if we protect that, our maritime interests will also be protected. I mean, this is not just helping India only. It will have a beneficial effect on Sri Lanka also. I believe you ask about another issue is the fishery issue. Uh, am I right, uh, Neelima? Yes, sir. The yeah. Now, this is a very complicated issue. Uh, I think there are scientific issues. There are economic issues. There are political issues. There are livelihood issues. So we need to find a, a, a solution to this looking at, you know, I don't want to give you a very diplomatic answer and saying everything is good, everything is not good. You know, in the world, bottom trawling is banned. Now, bottom trawling is actually destroying the marine habitat because you are scraping the bottom, the corals, the seaweed, the juvenile fish, everything is gone. So unfortunately, uh, uh, most of the Indian trawlers are engaged in bottom trawling. That is an issue. Now, that is a, one would argue, if we stop that, it becomes a livelihood issue for Tamil Nadu fishermen. Yes, that is true. I mean, then if they don't go to sea, their livelihood is impacted. But what about the Sri Lankan fishermen? You know, the Tamil, uh, Tamil fishermen, especially in the northern part, they suffered for more than three decades because of the war we had. They could not go out to sea freely. They could not engage in their traditional artisanal fishing, right? They suffered for a long period. And now, 2009, the conflict ended. Everything was back to normal other than the ocean, right? Because they don't have big trawlers to go out and catch fish or shrimp. They have very small boats. Only for a few hours, they can go, uh, go out and come back. They are not matched in any way for the big Indian uh, fishing trawlers. So I think we need to call a spade a spade. I mean, of course, I do agree that there is a livelihood issue, but scientifically, bottom trawling is banned. And then if you look at the because India is a very responsible player in the international domain, in the UN system, in sustainable development goal. Now, sustainable development goal 14 talks about this issue and they say life below water, sustainable exploitation of ocean resources, right? Now, if we destroy a resource and exploit it, it's not good, right? It's not good. I mean, in my opinion, the bottom trawling should stop, right? Of course, I know that Indian government has undertaken many measures, buyback arrangement to buy back the trawlers, uh, provide alternative livelihood, uh, provide uh, a changing of fishing methods by you know long line fishing that those things but i don't know whether those initiatives which were taken by the center did materialize to the expectations i'm not sure i don't know that i don't have any updated information i think those need to be implemented right and unfortunately now if you go to the jaffna district People are unhappy about this. People talk even freely. They, they say, look, now we are having a free time, but we can't go to sea because Indian trawlers, <clears throat> if they go across our net, our entire net is damaged. That means my livelihood. So I think we need to look at the humanitarian aspect of both sides. We need to look at the livelihood issue of both sides, not only the large scale fishing trawler fleet, coming from Indo uh, India, not only the fish and prawn processing plants in uh, Tamil Nadu, that is, yes, it, I think people must have invested heavily on those things. But we really need to look at this in a very scientific manner and humanitarian manner and livelihood manner and find a solution. We must really not I, I don't want to use the word, but beat around the bush. We must address the issue upfront. India is too big a country, too responsible player to allow this to happen. So this is basically, I'm actually expressing the views uh, not only as a naval officer, but as a, as a person who has a lot of connection to Northern fishermen, as a person who has not a lot of uh, friends uh, among the fishing community in the Northern part of Sri Lanka. They keep telling me, when I was the secretary, they kept telling me, can you do something to stop it? But you know, I can't do only some little, I can't do uh, beyond that. So this is a problem. You know, this is basically, if you look at from the international law, I mean, maritime law, uncross point of view, it is not good to do that. If you look at the national security view, 
It is not to go that because like thousands of Indian trawlers crossing the international maritime boundary line coming to very close to Sri Lankan northern coast, it is posing a huge national security threat, not only for Sri Lanka, but for southern India, basically to India as well. Who knows what these people will do? They come so close. Who knows what they uh, will carry back? Is it only the prawns and the fish? No, they can, uh, they, they may be uh, uh, carrying, they could be carrying something else which can be detrimental to Indian coastal security. I'm not talking about the big security, but coastal security, you must never forget what happened in 2008, Mumbai attack. It came by a small fishing boat. It was not by a major big ship. It came by a, an Indian fishing boat and that, really was a devastating attack against Indian soil. So we really must put down facts, call it the spade, a spade, and address all these issues and find a solution. There is this talk that fishermen to fishermen talks can resolve it. No, no way, because Tamil Nadu fishermen are on one side and the Northern fishermen are on another side. They are not on the same page. So they cannot. And again, they cannot even come to an agreement because this is an bilateral issue. This is basically uh, almost an international issue. So I, I wish that now that we are really uh, talking uh, in great detail of establishing, not merely establishing, firming our relations, confirming our relations, building upon that, this is the best opportunity we have to address the issue in a true sense. Thank you so much, sir. You clearly highlighted where the fisherman issue is an issue of sustainability as well as where it is. On the other side, it is a livelihood, livelihood issues where solutions has to be taken, keeping in mind the scientific aspects and everything. And also, uh, the past experience also show us that the coastal security is so much important to us uh, because of the Mumbai attacks and other things. So uh, I think an immediate solution has to be taken in place uh, with regard to this. And also on the other side, uh, it was only a month ago the Sri Lankan Foreign Minister Ali Sabri was in Beijing and during the visit, both countries agreed to pursue high quality Belt and Road cooperation. So they emphasized that Colombo would maintain a neutral stance in tensions between China and India. And also it is understandable for Sri Lanka as a nation striving to balance relations with two significant powers in the region is necessary. So also President Rani Vikram Singh also asserted that Sri Lanka will maintain its neutrality and not become a base for any threats against India, while also skillfully balancing relations between India and China. So how do you, uh, how would you describe and analyze Sri Lanka's approach uh, in managing this delicate solution? How long will it be possible for Sri Lanka to maintain a balanced approach with India and China? Well, I think it's critically important for a small country like Sri Lanka to have balanced relationship with everyone. Practically, I mean, I don't really want to limit it to India, China, but practically with everyone to have good relations. I, I will mention you two uh, slogans that we use. Uh, we are enemy to none, but friend, friend to all. That is one thing, enemy to none, but friend to all. And also, uh, one of our presidents earlier mentioned that India is our neighbor and others are our friends, right? Our neighbor, our relative, he used the word relative. India is our relative and others are our close friend. So uh, strength of a small country like Sri Lanka, you know, one thing I have to mention because of the three decade old conflict we had in Sri Lanka, many things retarded in the country. You know, the economic progress went down, development went down, nothing new was really added during this period because the government or successive governments couldn't really invest long term on infrastructure development, right? So Sri Lanka lacked very badly basic infrastructure, roads, highways, airports, ports, water distribution system. These five areas Sri Lanka lacked very badly. Now, 2009, the conflict ended and now everyone expected a very fast track development of infrastructure. I mean, till 2009, we did not have a single highway. 
our international airport from colombo to go to uh, the city of colombo it took one and a half hours but then we built a small highway and now in 20 minutes from the airport you are in colombo right so now infrastructure is critically important for any developing country because if the infrastructure is good then we can develop other areas now can india look after all infrastructure development of sri lanka i think answer is no i don't think you should even do it right but you can play a critical role of course you rehabilitated the entire railway line from vaunia to kankasanthure you built more than 50000 houses and you cleared large areas of mines which now people are living right and you develop palali airport you develop kankasanthure harbor now the ships are running in bit, uh, between so india did quite a lot but then it was not enough right so that is why we had to go to other countries and then of course china was a willing partner to invest and then china came in a big way and started working but then i think right now the president has stated very clearly that india as far as strategic security is concerned india is priority number 1 sacrosanct no change in that but for economic partnership economic development we need to work with other countries not only china whether it is japan china eu us now middle east is a booming region right it's coming up big time we need to work with everyone now if we want to work with everyone to develop our economy to develop our infrastructure best way is to be neutral a small country like sri lanka does not have the luxury of band wagoning with one power or a group of power against another we can't we don't have that luxury we have to be very carefully managing our relationship with everyone and we need to remain neutral non alignment even india is a firm a firm believer of non alignment uh, non alignment is the way forward for sri lanka right you see if you look at indian ocean it is not only rich in fish and uh, seaweed it is the richest ocean in maritime strategies there are more than 15 maritime strategies focusing on indian ocean and the western pacific although they call it indo pacific it is basically indian ocean and the western pacific ocean right more than 15 strategies now what can we do can we select one and be with that and say no 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 we are only with one party we are not with you no we can't we mean we need to maintain neutrality we need to maintain balanced approach but our wish is common to india we want a peaceful stable maritime region that is period we need that and we need an international rules based maritime order we don't need any single hegemony coming from outside and dictating terms to our affairs no we don't right so this is i think it's a very broad subject because it's lot of issues encompassing this area it is not easy but sri lanka so far has managed quite well this balancing game uh, we don't have the luxury of band wagoning we don't have the luxury of joining one camp against the other we need to balance now i mean we must not forget india is lot of uh, dealing lot in trade with china i think india china trade relations have grown over the years now of course we know that china is the kind of the workshop of the world until very recently now india is fast becoming that right so i mean when you go to a shop even in jakarta i think 80% of the things we see made in china right that is the reality right so we need to benefit from everyone and also i must say we need to benefit from the strength of everyone right we need to benefit i mentioned the strong economic performance during the last decade in india we need to pick back on that whether accepting rupee as a currency perfect why not right and even barter we give you this and you give us why not right we need and also i must mention tourism sector number one tourist arrivals to sri lanka are from india so we must cultivate it and make it double triple because tourism money is straight forward money you don't really have to spend much you don't have to invest because all the hotels are built 
right? I mean, not like other industries, you have to really invest. If a tourist come and spend $100, that is $100 net uh, for Sri Lanka. So we need to balance this relation. I think my foreign minister has mentioned this time and again. My president has mentioned this time and again. We are enemy to none, but friend to all, right? And also I like to share, you know, uh, I become with the Navy background, I monitor uh, how many warships visiting Sri Lanka frequently, right? Now, for about uh, 2008 to 2023, about 638 warships have visited Sri Lanka. That is a large number and coming from nearly 28 different countries. And who is on top? India, right? So that is our strength. That is our relations, right? That is what we should cultivate. And believe it or not, second in that list is not China, it is Japan, right? Third, way below is China, right? So this is the reality because geographical proximity has given us a great connection with India, right? We need to cultivate that. We need to develop that for a meaningful, sustainable, time-based, action-oriented, result-oriented process and not talk only. So, but right now I'm so happy that I see many positive sides coming from both the countries and Sri Lanka is treating uh, in, in India with great respect and India is equally treating Sri Lanka with great respect and understanding. So we have a great platform. We need to balance this game. We should not be uh, bandwagoning with only one. We can't, we cannot afford to do that. We need to balance, we need to benefit from the economic development of India, economic development of China, Japan, Korea. Now, our latest focus is actually look East, right? We may have copied the, the uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, look East policy. My, my president is very keen on this look East policy, especially focusing on ASEAN, because we know ASEAN is the fastest developing region in the world, right? So we, together with India, we are maritime neighbors of ASEAN, right? So we need to benefit from the newly developing major economies. And then look at the Middle East, look at how Saudi Arabia is coming up, look at what UAE is doing, look at other countries doing, Qatar, Oman, Bahrain, right? So we need to benefit from everyone. And Africa is still, I think, a sleeping giant with so much of natural resources, right? So this we need to benefit in the future. We need to balance everyone and benefit to develop our small, our economy is quite small. If we can benefit one country with uh, two, three million, uh, through two, three billion dollars, that will be a big amount for us. So we need to really benefit from uh, everyone, but we need to ensure, I repeat this, that Sri Lanka will not be a strategic security concern to India. Thank you so much, sir. That was another insightful comment from you, where Sri Lanka being a small country is trying to gain from the strength of every other countries in the world. And also you clearly assured that Sri Lanka won't be a threat to India at all in the near future or any in the future at all. So uh, coming to the uh, other things, like what are the other challenges you think both the countries need to prioritize in the near future? And uh, what are the possible solutions uh, which we can come up with them effectively? This is like a general question to you. Well, I would say both countries have a great responsibility to work on this preventing and mitigating climate change. It is important to India. It is important to Sri Lanka. You know, the climate does not really have demarcated borders. If something is impacting India, it will impact Sri Lanka, vice versa, same. So this is another area I think our both leaders mentioned, they spoke about it, combating climate change, right? So this is something, and also uh, India has advanced technologies in green energy, whether it is hydrogen energy, phosphorus energy, and solar energy and wind energy. Right? So this is something we need to work immediately because this is the silent enemy. You don't see it until it hits you. Right, The environment has changed. Global warming is real. Ocean temperature has risen 13% more than the scientists envisage. And there is a dead zone of 60,000 square kilometers in the Bay of Bengal. There is a huge garbage patch in the southern Indian Ocean. And we keep on dumping plastic 
every year, right? Because we are burning fossil fuel, we are producing carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and we are producing greenhouse gases. So environment, I think, because I spoke about the economic, uh, I spoke about connectivity, I spoke about uh, strategic mil military, uh, Navy to Navy connections, but I think the most important thing right now, while we do all the other things that uh, we mentioned, is to combat the environmental degradation jointly. Because if the ocean level rise by one meter, maybe two thirds of Sri Lanka is gone. And imagine, because in India also, you have 7,500 kilometers of coastline, and majority of those coastlines are not above one meter. It is almost with the sea level. So that will be a great, great destruction and to the people and not only the country, to the people, right? So we need to address this issue of combating environmental degradation, which will prevent ocean, I mean, uh, the global warming, uh, ocean level rising, increasing of acidification. I think this should be the priority area. Now, I mentioned again, the unforeseen enemy, blue economy. Protecting the, I mean, I have a very simple two or uh, four words for blue economy, ocean wealth and ocean health. Ocean wealth and ocean health. We must derive the wealth from the ocean, but we must maintain the health of ocean. Now there again, two countries need to work on the ocean health, especially. Of course, we need to derive the benefits from the ocean wealth, that is true, but we must focus our expertise, best practices. Now, Sri Lanka has done wonders in mangrove growing. Sri, La Sri Lanka has done wonders in coral reef growing. There is a new coral reef coming off Colombo now, as we speak. Right Now, we, these are some of the expertise that we have gained being a small island nation. Right now, we need to share these best practices, right? Because I keep saying 7,500 kilometers of coastline is not a joke, it's huge, right? Unless we join together to protect the environment. And our leaders spoke about it. The, the, the two leaders mentioned this protecting the environment is critically important for two countries, and we need to work in a more dedicated manner to protect the environment, which is the silent unforeseen enemy of the humankind and the global. It is not only regional, it is not only domestic, it is not only regional, but it is a global phenomena. We need to work together mainly on uh, combating uh, climate change. That is number one. Of course, other area is combating transnational maritime crime, piracy, illegal narcotic trafficking, human smuggling, weapon smuggling. All these are happening across the Indian Ocean, unfortunately, still, right? Sri Lanka Navy alone arrested more than 3,000 kilograms of heroin. Imagine this 3,000, that is three metric tons of heroin. If this went to the market somewhere, how many people will it kill, right? We don't know where it was going exactly, right? So 3,000, uh, 3,000 uh, 3, uh, kilograms of drugs arrested in the Indian Ocean. That means Indian Ocean maritime security is still under threat. Of course, there is this uh, state versus state competition. I will not talk about it. That's a threat, but then that is a big, big picture. But the non-traditional security threat like climate change or the ocean level rising, increasing salinity, these are killing our planet killing our water, killing our ocean, and maintaining readiness against maritime crime. Although larger powers are behaving in a better way, international rules-based order, the smaller non-state actors are not. So we need to be very mindful of that. Both issues, we need to work collaboratively, not cooperatively. Cooperate, we talk, we want to cooperate, that's enough. Let us work collaboratively in these two key areas, which I consider as an imminent threat to the humankind. Of course, another area is diffusing tension at sea. This is another area. Now I work in Jakarta here, then ASEAN is very keen on maintaining this as a region of peace. 
ASEAN is very keen on maintaining this as a no nuclear weapon zone, no weapons of mass destruction zone, right? So these are things happening in ASEAN because like Sri Lanka and India, a lot of strategic interest is in ASEAN because it is the, 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 the combine of Bay of Bengal and the Western Pacific. That is the confluence of the two oceans. ASEAN is at the center. So that is why ASEAN is now coming out with ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific strategy, ASEAN maritime outlook, ASEAN regional forum, archipelagic and island state forum. All these are talking about combating maritime crime and protecting the environment. So India, being a big country, major player in the Indian Ocean, has a greater role to play in this dimension. And Sri Lanka should work collaboratively, target set results-oriented approach. Thank you so much, sir, for this engaging session. As we have come to the end, we can rightly conclude from this discussion that the outcome of the visit was really positive and which opens up new chapters to India-Sri Lanka relations. Now it is the, in the hands of the bureaucrats uh, to take timely actions to make the initiatives into practicals rather than making it go into waste. However, issues in maritime domains related to fishermen, illicit drug trafficking and other threats have to be addressed through scientific and effective solutions. India is always the first priority for Sri Lanka, but for economic development, Sri Lanka need to work with other countries as well. Sri Lanka being a small country need to remain neutral and non-aligned, but the wish of India and Sri Lanka is both common, that is a peaceful maritime region. Other areas that both the countries need to immediately work upon will be combating climate change, where we need to work immediately on this as it is a silent enemy for both the countries. Both the countries also should work on the blue economy by engaging expertise in the areas and sharing the best practices. Uh, also combating national, transnational maritime crimes are also other areas that needs immediate solution. We would like to add, uh, we would like to express a heartfelt gratitude to Ambassador Admiral uh, Jainath Kolumbage for sharing his profound insights on India-Sri Lanka relations. Through our discussion, we have gained a deeper understanding of the convergences, interests, and challenges that define this crucial relationship between India and Sri Lanka. Thank you, sir, once again, and thank you all for listening. Uh, the CPPR team will be back with uh, another interesting topic. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>